It was the empire on which the sun never set, or as some said, on which the blood never dried. At its height, Britain ruled over a quarter of the world's population. Many convinced themselves it was Britain's destiny to do so. Much of the empire was built on greed and a lust for power. But the British came to believe. Slavery, mapped the world's uncharted oceans and generally forced Britain's will onto foreign governments. That heritage helped Britain to believe she's still entitled to a place at the top table in world affairs. How did such a small country get such a big head? So much that shaped the extraordinary story of the British Empire was born here, in the complex, time-worn expanse of India. It was here the British learned the art of imperial power. Yet it was a treaty signed thousands of miles away that determined the fate of India. In February 1763, the great European powers were meeting in Paris to end years of war and to divide the world between them, from Canada to the Philippines. Britain's representative at the peace talks was the Duke of Bedford, a stubby, arrogant little man who'd never been to any of these places. In fact, his gout had made it difficult enough for him to get to Paris. But the Bedfords did pretty well out of the summit. The Duchess was given an 800-piece porcelain dinner service by the King of France. And the Duke? The Duke got India for the British.
Britain couldn't by itself find the manpower to hold on to this vast new territory. So they came up with a system that would become a cornerstone of empire. They paid local soldiers to fight for them. British officers would now lead Indian troops. The colonized would provide the fighting force of colonialism for centuries to come. The Madras Regiment, founded in 1758, is the oldest from an Indian nationalist point of yeah, view, basically you were fighting soldier. for the British. We were soldiers and a soldier does not know whose region it is for his fighting. Tomorrow I have a fight with any other country, I am told to fight with that country, I'm, I don't have any personal well, value. Do you, think, I mean, do you think the British being here was a good thing or a bad thing or what? And if whatever happens in the history is history, <laughs> but still we should not be going into that. But yes, they have done good for us and even bad for us that way. But you it's a good thing they're not here, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but all the troops you could hire could never control such a huge country. <laughs> the British needed a political system to keep them in power. And they found it in the Fantastic goal there by Marathkar. They have finally woken up Lady Kenford. In time, the ruling classes of the two peoples would become entwined. The present Maharaja is the product of both cultures. This is the family palace designed for them by a British architect. Understated little place. Good morning. Good morning. But as the British extended their grip on India, they tore up the treaty they'd made with the Maharaja's ancestor. They stripped the Maharajas of their power, but let them keep their palaces. The 
this way. This is your drawing room, is this it? This is my drawing room, yes. This is, we've tucked ourselves into a little corner of the palace. And um, all these these chaps on the walls there are my ancestors, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, absolutely. That's my father behind you. Mm -hmm. And that's my great, great, great grandfather. Great, great, great grandfather. Mm. Splendid yeah. beard. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose the first question is, what, what should I call you? Babji. Bab what does that mean? Everyone calls me Babji. Babji is a term of endearment as well as a term of respect. Uh, and what does it mean? In, uh, literally, it means Bab, which means father. And G is like an honorific. But even, even as a child, you were called Babji? Yes, absolutely. Um, your own involvement, of course, in Britain is considerable, isn't it? Since the age of eight. You were sent away to school in England, Prep then? school, yes. Prep school to Cot Hill, then Eton, then Oxford. Fourteen years in all. So you were really brought up as an English child? English. get the best out of the, the system. And at that point, it, it be becomes unclear who's pulling whose strings, yes. doesn't it? <laughs> Quite tricky. Mm. At the heart of British authority was a gigantic confidence trick. It worked for as long as the illusion could be maintained. As one British Governor-General who lived here put it, if each black man were to take up a handful of sand and by united effort throw it upon the white-faced intruders, we should be buried alive. And that's the reason for the scale, the grandeur, the sheer, the sheer boastfulness of this place. The idea being, if you look like a ruler, the people will treat you like a ruler. It helps to explain that arrogant, self-satisfied look you see on the faces of so many British imperialists. But the appearance was an enormous bluff. It could only be a matter of time before that bluff was called.
uh, but during the course of the siege became used as the hospital and was absolutely packed uh, with the wounded, obviously, but also the sick, because inevitably what happened was that all the latrines filled up and overflowed and there were corpses rotting in the heat everywhere, so cholera broke out. And it was the job of many of the small children to, to wipe the flies off the faces and the wounds of the injured inside the hospital there. It must have been an absolutely appalling scene. After four and a half months, British relief forces arrived. As they fought their way into the stinking ruins, they showed no mercy. In the story of empire, rebellion always met with savage retaliation. The psychological impact of the conflict was massive. Each side now knew how very thin was the veneer of civilized coexistence, that with the right provocation, they could unleash hell on each other. the kid gloves. The British would soon find a new way of showing who was boss. Look there. This bleak patch of waste ground outside Delhi was once the setting for a series of extraordinary spectacles. They were called Durbars, the Indian word for a meeting between ruler and ruled. It was less a meeting than a ceremonial show of strength. One Indian called it terror in fancy dress. Presiding over each of these gaudy ceremonies was the British ruler in India, the Viceroy. One of them understood the power of extravagant display better than any other. Lord George Nathaniel Curzon went the rhyme, was a most superior person. He liked to assemble his magnificent uniform. A few old statues in the corner of this foreign field are all that's left. Hello. 
even the caretaker of this peculiar place isn't much interested. Hello. Hello. Can I ask you some questions? What do you think of all the statues just down here? Oh, I'm afraid we're some of the occasional white men. But what, do you know what happened here? I'm not very interested. There's one relic of the British Raj that still exerts something of its old magic. Empress, mother, virtual god. In the years following the mutiny, over 50 statues of her were commissioned and shipped out from Britain. The Maharaja of Baroda, for example, paid 15 and a half thousand pounds for a solid marble statue. And at the feet of it, flowers were regularly laid, and every week it was given a shampoo to keep the old queen looking spruce. Victoria had plenty to smile about. A mix of enterprise and cunning, brutality and pomp had turned India into the biggest, richest and most significant colony in the empire. By the closing years of Victoria's reign, India formed the heart of an empire that stretched See. If the Indian Durbars were designed to cow the empire's subjects, the Jubilee was a piece of theatre meant to fire the British public with imperial fervour. A vast cavalcade made its way across As the procession passed, its star reporter was quite overcome. You begin to understand, as never before, what the empire amounts to. Not only that we possess all these remote, outlandish places, but that we send out a boy 
and he takes hold of savages and teaches them to obey him and to believe in him and to die for him and the queen. But not everyone shared this sense of wide-eyed amazement. There were some who looked at the spectacle and wondered. They remembered the splendor of the Roman Empire and how that had fallen. How could an empire that wouldn't stop growing be sustained? And in particular, how could the great prize of India be secured? The answer to that had already taken the British to some pretty unexpected places. the British grew nervous. The Cairo riots triggered a classic piece of imperial footwork. The pattern goes like this. British people or British interests are threatened. British forces Good morning. Thank you. For many years, Egypt was run quietly from this building, now the British Embassy. And this was the man who ran it, ruling Egypt for over 20 years and perfecting the strange machinery of British power in the Middle East, Sir Evelyn Baring. Officially, he was just consul general rather than colonial governor, but with 6,000 troops stationed next door, there was no doubt who was in charge. It wasn't just his size that gave him the nickname Overbearing. Bering was an imperialist through and through. 
He regarded the Egyptians and indeed most foreigners as children. And he treated them accordingly, with occasional concern and permanent disdain. It earned him their profound resentment. Bering allowed the Egyptian elite to imagine they were still running the country. The British are easy to deceive, said one Egyptian politician, but when you think you've deceived them, they give you the most tremendous kick in the backside. As they did all over the empire, British officials in Cairo repaired to the club at the end of the working day. You can be so mean in croquet, can't you? And it is in many countries now. It is in many countries, yeah. yes. Hello, Have you been a member here a very long time? In the club? Yes, about more than 50 years, 55 years. 55 years. years. Do you remember when the British were here? Yes. And what did you think? Uh, I think they were uh, forbidding any Egyptian to enter this club unless they take a license from really? the British. Yes. Were you glad to see the English go? For sure. <laughs> we weren't all bad, were we? Huh? We weren't all bad. All kinds of imperialism is bad. <laughs> but there was was there nothing good that the British did here? Yeah, I knew. Mean, Well, it's very nice of you. Thank you very much. Yes. Particularly in light of this our history. This is one of the good things which the imperialism did. In there you are, you found one thing. <laughs> the temporary intervention in Egypt, the bit of empire that never was, would last into the middle of the 20th century. He wasn't here to be loved, but I wonder what he'd have made of the fact that even generations later there were Egyptians traveling to England to spit on his grave. As the 20th century dawned, Britain's sense of its role in the world had given it dangerous delusions about what it could do.
World War and its aftermath would expose these delusions in a merciless fashion. The First World War stretched far beyond the mud and trenches of Northern Europe. The region was ruled by Britain's war enemy, Turkey. In their de people. That love affair created one of the most romantic figures in the history of the British Empire. Thomas Edward Lawrence. Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence, the illegitimate son of an Irish baronet, scholar, archaeologist, linguist, was just the man to charm and inspire the Arabs into a desert revolt. The story of an Englishman leading an exotic army across the desert caught the public's imagination. In contrast to the mud and murder of the Western Front, here was a sweeping campaign fought in blazing sunlight. passion for the Arabs and their way of life, his ability to live like them impressed them. So did the gold from the British treasury he brought to pay them. And he gave them something more, a belief in themselves as an Arab nation, as his masters in London The promises that he made were ever kept. <laughs> Lawrence promised his Arab fighters freedom from foreign rule. They believed Palestine would be theirs. There would be many more promises made and just as many broken.
The war in the desert finally brought Britain a string of heady victories. Imperial troops from India, Australia and New Zealand, as well as Britain, swept across the region. By the winter of 1917, the ultimate prize was within their grasp. The holy city itself. And so was born the dangerous conviction that the interests of the British Empire and the will of God might be one and the same. But Jerusalem was sacred to other faiths, too. A thousand years before Christ, it was the capital of the Jews. Sharing the city with the Jews in relative peace were the Arabs, for whom Jerusalem was one of the holiest cities in Islam. For the British Prime Minister Lloyd George, the empire now began to feel like a divine mission. Most British political leaders had been brought up on the Bible. They were steeped in its geography, and as for its history, well, Lloyd George claimed that as a boy he knew the names of the kings of Israel long before he knew the names of the kings of England. Playing God in the Holy Land was an astonishing gesture. The British had come to feel they were agents of destiny. They had become powerful enough and you might say well-meaning enough to believe they could solve the problems of the world. The promised land had now been promised once too often. Over the next decade, as more
British want peace at any price. They try to restore order, search everybody. They act as if both sides are equally guilty. To the Arabs, the British had broken the promise of freedom made to them by Lawrence. Instead, the Arabs were having to give up their land to the Jews. The Jews felt the British were failing to honor the terms of the Balfour Declaration and the promise of a national home for them. Both sides made their case with Jellignite. Both sides committed appalling atrocities. government offices and casualties were very heavy. 91 people were killed including 41 Arabs, 28 British and 17 Jews. Sara Agassi was 17 at the time. No, it's not here. There. Through there. Let's go. It was open. Do you recognize it? Yeah, of course. We came from here. This was the place that you had been looking at when you yes. came dancing that day? Yes, here. Here was the bar and here was the orchestra. And all this was very big and we danced. A lot of chairs and uh, tables beautifully lamps and everything was very beautiful. Now, wh where were the bombs put? Into these uh, columns. This is a, one of the columns that supports the whole hotel, I guess. Yes, or yes. This corner of the it's hotel. not one. One, two, three, but four, five. Five columns, five bombs. <laughs> Do you not feel any 
thanks at all to the British. I mean, without the Balfour Declaration, there would have been no Jewish homeland in this part of the world. Sure. The motive is neither here nor there. I mean, it, it, whatever the motive was, do you not think that the Balfour Declaration the right of the Jews to have a homeland uh -huh. in Palestine. It was a good start. That was a good thing, wasn't it? Yes. And are you not grateful for the British for that? daubed on a wall and beneath it a despairing squaddy wrote I wish we well could what Lawrence called the British love of policing other men's muddles had proved a disaster The Middle East taught the British a lesson that all empires have to learn sooner or later. That though you may begin with ambition and come to believe you'll last forever, one day you will have a head-on collision with reality. In the end, and there is no disguising this fact, the British ran away. It was May 1948. One departing official commented bitterly, it is surely a new technique in our... The bluff of British omnipotence had been called. It would be called again and again over the next few decades. The empire that had lasted more than 200 years would be dismantled in scarcely 20. The British were beginning to lose interest. The battered country that emerged from the Second World War was more concerned with bettering the lives of its citizens than anything else. An American politician later remarked that the British people had decided they preferred free aspirins and false teeth to a role in the world. But it hasn't entirely turned out that way. Britain has embarked on seven foreign wars. There were arguments aplenty for fighting any one of them. But you can't help wondering if without the memory of empire, Britain would have plunged in quite so readily. It's as if we can't quite let go of who we once were.
still to come. How Britain grew rich on profits from the drug trade and from the traffic in human beings. How it brought Christianity to Africa and the gospel of sport to the world. And next time, how British men and women made themselves at home in the far-flung colonies of empire. To order a free Open University poster exploring the legacy of Britain's empire, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash empire or call 0845 366 8021.